The city of Eibar boasts a rich history of gun making and currently boasts some of the finest gunsmiths in the world. I made the pilgrimage here to learn more about the history of this place and visit some of the amazing gun makers here. This place has been making guns for nearly 600 years. That is some heritage, and they still make guns today. But to truly understand today, we need to take a look at the last 600 years. The use of gunpowder weapons in Europe can trace its origins back to 1331 AD. From there, we've seen near constant change, development, and improvement. Every country has had its own part to play in this journey, and few can boast as rich a history as Spain. The first ever shoulder-fired guns was called an arquebus or harquebus, which was invented in Spain in the 1500s, and soon an entire industry arose to build these guns with guilds of barrel makers, guilds of stock makers, and guilds of action finishers. The main centre of this industry was in the province of Jupuscoa, of which the beating heart was the city of Eibar. This area is located in the north of Spain in the Basque region, and the city is still thriving with gunmaking history and a collection of makers specialising in sporting arms. Ibar as a municipality has always had gunmaking at its heart and understands that to succeed, gunmaking needed to succeed. So in 1812 they opened what is this behind me? This is the Escuela Armaria, the gunmaker's school of Ibar. The purpose of the school wasn't so much to teach gunmaking, although that was obviously a large part of the curriculum. People could go and learn gun making by going and working as apprentices. The purpose was to ensure a future of gun making. They were teaching science, maths, physics, and the future of mechanization to ensure that when these people left and went to the gun makers, the gun makers didn't just do the same thing they'd done before, but invested in new technology to try and dominate the world gun making market. And by 1988, this place actually ended up becoming a normal school. Nowadays, it's a polytechnic. It's a upper level learning academy for all sorts of things based around engineering, mechanics, science, physics, and yet it is still called the Escuela Armaria, the Polytechnic Escuela Armaria, which is, it's pretty cool. This whole place honors its gun past. To understand what this town is like today, we need to go back to the early 1900s. Abar at this point was a mass producer of pistols and rifles, either of their own designs or of copies of various patents. Their weak economy led them to be a neutral country during World War I, in which Spanish gunmakers found mass demand for their produce. The armies of Europe were expanding and needed to arm their men. France ordered 30,000 pistols a month from one gunmaker in Guernica alone. These varied in quality a lot. A lot of mechanical changes in the early 20th century led to this place becoming a serious player on the world stage. And with the outbreak of World War I, the Spanish took up the opportunity and produced guns for military contracts for the armies of Europe. This unfortunately came to an end with the armistice at the end of the war. The First World War saw a boom in the Spanish economy. However, on the ground, the people saw a near doubling of the price of normal goods, which led to unrest with the working man. After the war, exports fell nearly 40% and companies and workers suffered. Traditional social structures needed to change. Politics has played a really interesting role in the history of Ibar and the history of the gun making here. In 1920, there was a prolonged strike from the workers from the Orbea factory. They weren't being paid or treated fairly. So those workers went and teamed up with a local socialist party and with their backing founded a new kind of company, a company where the workers were also the shareholders and owners. The outcome was better pay, better condition. Although there were wins at this time for the gun making community, Spain was entering a politically turbulent period. In 1936, the country ended up in civil war. During the Spanish Civil War, the Basque government remained loyal to the Republic, producing pistols and machine pistols for the army, until the town came under Franco's control in 1937. As you'd expect, the town of Eibar was the site of fierce combat. Neither side had wanted to destroy the gun-making infrastructure with the type of bombing that had happened in Guernica, and the town still bears marks of that conflict today. That essentially brings us into the modern era and out of a 500 year period of military arms manufacture. I guess the point here is that gun making runs in these people's veins. To learn more about the transition from military to sporting arms, I met up with Simon at Holtz Auctioneers, a place that sees many thousands of Spanish guns go through their hands every year. When the war came to an end and that market collapsed, there was suddenly a gap. 
all of this huge amount of effort and industry that had been going on and the money they'd been making wasn't there anymore. So they, it seems to me, looked around to see other avenues of arms manufacture, what they could turn their attention to instead. In the 40s and 50s, uh, they came across the shotgun market. Essentially, what allowed them to copy the best of what we had in Britain and make it uh, is that if you patent something, you have to manufacture it in, inside the Spanish borders to be able to protect that patent. If not, the Spanish consider it free reign. So the Holland Royal was taken over to Spain, looked at, copied, built more cheaply, and sold into the English marketplaces, the AYA number two. The Anselin Dealey box lock, the AYA number four, they're everywhere. But they were made in bulk uh, to supply a thirsty market in the UK for good, cheap, quality cyber sites. They took the guns of the aristocrats and made them for the everyman. They were morphing all the time and improving all the time, but essentially they were basing their designs on the best they could find. They were building them to a price point and they were pushing them into the market and they did extremely well with them. During the 1960s and 70s, the gun manufacturing industry in Spain went from strength to strength, with companies reinvesting in more staff and bigger factories. <laughs> Luckily enough, this period, as well as the last 600 years, is well documented in the Arms Museum of Eibar, which was high on my list of places to visit. Behind me is the old AYA factory. It used to extend all the way down and all the way back. This was a serious business, as were most of the businesses in the valley. This was wall-to-wall -wall industry. It's an extremely prosperous part of Spain, and it still is. Nowadays, no guns are made in this building, but on the fourth floor is housed the Arms Museum of Ibar, and I am psyched to go and have a look around. Let's go. This museum should be on any shotgun lover's bucket list. 600 years of the firearms industry. This place is absolutely amazing for anyone who's into guns. I mean, I've been to the Royal Armoury, I've been to a lot of places, but this, as a, as a UK gun fan, or a fine gun fan, a double gun fan, is amazing. Everything from the earliest guns that were made here, five, 600 years ago, all the way through to modern stuff, including military arms, You've got a gun here that was made by the Spanish for the French Marquis in the Second World War. You've got an entire piece, an entire video on Damascene work, display on Damascene work. Damascening is the process of inlaying gold into iron or steel. Whether it's to your taste or not, you have to appreciate the art and skill that this sort of work takes. I really enjoyed the learning experience that this place offered, and in the end, had to be dragged out of the library to carry on our tour of Abar. Spain once again suffered an economic downturn in the late 70s and early 80s. The Spanish gunmakers were hit hard, and when the mighty Victor Sarasquita finally closed their doors, all of the gunmakers were justifiably worried. Eventually, the Spanish government intervened, funding a project to unify all of the gunmakers under one banner. That cooperative banner was DR. The concept was to join workforces and resources and invest the government money into new equipment like CNC mills to modernize production. Nearly all of the gunmakers joined, including AYA, Sario Garte, Arizaga, Ugarta Buru, and Larinaga. Nowadays, what happened at Diam was actually a bit of a mystery. I asked everyone in the valley why it collapsed after only a few years. I heard every kind of story, from maybe the fact they never even built a gun, to the fact that all of that money magically disappeared. The big question was, if they bought all of these machines, where are the machines in the valley now? In short, Dion was a disaster. There's only two companies that really made it out of the live who were part of that. One of which was Keeman, Sano Guarte. They currently make beautiful guns, and we're going to go there in a second. And Aya. Aya, the name was bought by all of the workers who were there previously. They bought a lot of the machinery from DARM and moved into their current premises. For those of you who thought Spanish guns are all side by side, these guys prove that wrong. Although most of the other makers make an over and under, these guys specialize in it. I am at the Keeman factory who've made over and unders to the best standard since 1990. Let's have a quick look round. This place wasn't huge, but was clearly filled with passion. 
From the actioners to the stockers and engraving, everyone, including the owners, were working towards the common goal of making great guns. So my great-grandfather started with uh, another brand, which is Sarugarte. After that, my grandfather created Kemen in, the, in 1988. The word Kemen means uh, a strength in Basque language. These guns start at 12,500 euros, not cheap, but when you see that this is basically a handmade gun, it's not that bad either. So we have two types of models. One is the Ether, uh, is the short plate one, and the other one is the Suprema model, that is the long side plate one. Guns are available in both steel and titanium actions too, which to a gun geek like me is pretty awesome. From here, we headed up the mountain to meet Alex Aranzabal, owner of AYA, probably the most famous Spanish gunmaker. This place is called Tiro Pichon. It's a mountaintop shooting range above the city of Eibar. I guarantee you have never been to a ground with a view this good. Ah. Oh. We shot a few rounds of trap and a little bit of helis before eating great food and heading back into Abar to visit the new AYA factory. AYA factory was filled with gun making heritage. There was a showroom, offices, workbenches of people putting guns together, barrel makers, case color hardening and engravers and stockers. Perhaps more than any other gunmaker, AYA embodied the Spanish concept of copy and improve, and they built a gunmaking empire on that principle. Two of the things I saw there really highlighted that for me. The first was the rolled engraving. Traditional engraving is done with chisels or gravers, actually cutting out the patterns on the steel. This is going to be done by pushing, bolino, or hammer and chisel engraving. This takes a lot of time and a lot of skill. In order to copy grand designs and improve the price point of these guns, AYA opted for rolled engraving. They got high pressure rollers that would actually roll a pattern onto the lock plate. Yes, it's not true engraving, but one has to admire how good these guns look at what price point they were able to make them at. Seeing these old machines was pretty special and they're still in use today for certain models. The second fascinating thing was case color hardening. Traditional case color hardening is done by putting metal parts into a crucible filled with high carbon charcoals like leather and bone. It's heated up to an extreme temperature and then quenched. During that process, the metal actually takes carbon into the top layer of the steel, giving it that beautiful color. And then when it's dropped into water, it leaves an extremely glass hard layer on the top of the steel. This takes a lot of time, can produce some warpage, and is perhaps not the most consistent way of doing it at a high production level. And so the Spanish generally opted for a process called cyaniding. Instead of heating up the metal parts in high carbon charcoals, it was done in a solution of sodium cyanide. This was done at a much lower temperature, was significantly quicker, and still produced beautiful consistent colors and a hardened layer of 0.25 to 0.75 millimeters. To get to see this process firsthand was amazing. Of all the AYA models that embody their philosophy, there is none more popular and more perfect than the AYA number no. two, a copy of the Holland and Holland Royal. The number no. two is one of the best sellers of all time. It's a really good copy of Holland Royal in that you have the hand attachable lever so you can take off the lock plates quite easily without burring over screws. That was a patent from Holland. But the engraving is, it's not top of the range, but it's nice to look at. The color hardening is not top of the range, but it's nice to look at. And they have become more and more popular as people decide that Spanish side locks are what they want to put steel shot down. One of their attractive qualities is the fact there's lots of them around and you can pick them up relatively cheaply. People are happy to do things with that rather than Grandpa's Holland Royal that they don't want to damage in any way, shape or form. Like every factory on the strip, I had to be dragged out of this one to keep up with our schedule and we headed over to Garby to meet with John, who talked me through the current state and future of Spanish gun making. Well, this company was fundated in the late 50s. 
70s, 80s, they decide to make better models instead of quantity. They say, okay, we have to do less guns, but with higher quality. Eight years ago, we had customers asking, why not an over and under, why not? And we said, okay, guys, we have to make another step. That was a lot of work, a lot of development. Yes, at the beginning, yes. That model was a simple model, but three years ago, we said, okay, we need to make another step. Because, I mean, the taste of the customers is changing, and we decided to produce an over and under gun with a titanium material. It is spectacular. The, the thing that stands out most is this is hand engraved titanium by your in house engraver. Yes. It's spectacular, it really is stunning. It's tough to engrave if you compare with the steel, mm -hmm. but uh, the final result, I think that's a nice gun. What does the future look like for yourselves and for the gun industry in Eibar? We have a huge problem with the lack of labor or mm -hmm. workers. I mean, society has changed, and this is a very tough job where you must be passionate about what you are doing. And all, also talented. Obviously. It's a very hard mixture to find. You have to find that combination. And uh, it's a long-term uh, job. Someone who starts today, you need to be patient with him or with she. It could take, as we talked before, maybe 10 years. And 10 years, it's a lot of time. In the modern world, people don't want to work in the same no. industry for or no. the same job for that long. No, because here, sometimes we say that, welcome to the 60s or 70s, because the way of working here uh, didn't change so much. Which is uh, what makes it special. It is, there is something special about that. Obviously, that's why you and other uh, colleagues or shooters, or they are looking for something more than a gun. That seemed a pretty honest account of the current state of Spanish gun making. They've refined their products for a modern market and have found a customer base who wants something more than a machine-made gun. But they're struggling to recruit the next generation into this 600-year-old industry. I hope that with the passion that everybody in this valley has, it's a problem they're gonna overcome. So Ibar is very different to how I expected. In my head, this place would be perhaps an old industrial town in the middle of the Basque Country. It's not. This place is vibrant, new, awesome. The gun makers are producing some of the best guns out there. There's some of the best bikes in the world. There's some of the best industry in the world right here. And you can tell this place is a very industrious place, as it always has been. Guys, we have one last stop, and that is with Ariata and Arita Balaga, who were purchased a few years ago by a new owner. I didn't know what to expect when I went there, but I tell you what, this is some place. Enjoy. To end this video on Spanish guns, we're going to end it here at one of my favourite places, it turns out. It's not actually in Ibar, it's in Elgo Ibar, which is a few miles up the road. This is Arietta and Arieta Balaga's workshop. Arietta used to make a lot of guns back in the day, and you'll be familiar with a lot of their good quality side locks. They weren't known for making anything too cheap, everything they did was to a great standard. After Arietta bought Arieta Balaga, a few years later, they went out of business, unfortunately. They were purchased by a new owner a few years ago. 2020, the COVID year, most gun businesses across the well, didn't enjoy that year. Nobody was ordering guns in that year. But now these guys are back on top. If you've not heard of Aritha Balaga or Riza Balaga, they have only ever made the best. They, for a long time, never had a stock gun. They were 25% more expensive than every other Spanish gun and 25% better, potentially, because they took that money and they, they actually invested it in the gun. This wasn't Emperor's New Clothes stuff. This is extra finishing time, extra quality, extra handwork. And this is a modern iteration right here. This is an Pedro Aritha Balaga live pigeon gun. And I'm a big live pigeon gun fan being a big guy just look at the quality of this gun this is a stunning stunning thing and although we've had a quick look inside a few of the gun makers out there over in Ibar and in Elgo Ibar and although I'm gonna take this out and shoot it in a minute at Tiro Pichon let me give you the 50 cent tour of Arieta and Arieta Balaga So this is actually quite a sizable premises, and like every workshop we've been to, there's nooks and crannies. These are old buildings. And where the valley is relatively small, people make the most of the space they've got. You've got tidy workbenches. This place is very clean. You've got three guys on the bench today. There's usually five and an engraver. You've got their chief design. You've got another gun shop or another workshop down in Madrid. You've got a 
shooting ground down near Toledo. These guys are a, a different kind of company. They're not just a gun maker, they're a gun company. And that's something slightly different. And that's, I suppose, also part of what makes them special. A commitment to quality in the modern era, but also with an eye on the past. Obviously, a large part of the job is finishing and regulating. And as we've said, finishing and regulating a gun is, is what does make it great. But watching every part come together from every gun and seeing these guys polish things to perfection, they really do take it a step above everyone else. And that does come with at a price point, but it's nice to see Spanish best. I think a lot of people see Spanish and they understand there's going to be certain concessions over other makers and you have to pay X to get the top. These guys just do the best. And although they will make you whatever you want, I can't imagine that any of these gunsmiths, when they went out and found the best gunsmiths in the area, brought them in, would do a second rate job. You know, it's nice to see million dollar CNC machines here and there, but remembering that the gun making art is relatively ancient as these things go, you know, it's a 600 year old trade in this valley. Perhaps you don't need best modern tools to make best guns, given that certainly from the London area, everyone goes mad for that, that the 1920s guns being that they're the best. And yes, they had some machines, but they weren't much different to this kind of thing. Going through from the workshop into the back room, I found shelves upon shelves of interesting gun parts. The room was filled with reminders of past generations of gun makers and inspired me to dwell on what those days were actually like. Which relates kind of interestingly to one of the first lines in their new catalogue, which is, the past is prologue. It's a quote from Hamlet. And I suppose that's actually an interesting thing for the entire valley is anybody who starts something new and tries to go in a new direction needs to remember the heritage of what is going on and, and what's happened over the last 600 years to get these guys where they are today. This is my kind of place. I'm a, I'm a gun geek. I love stuff. You've got racks of barrels, racks of stocks, and I was going for a rummage earlier because I can't help myself being the, the gun loser, the gun geek that I am. You've got a proofed in 2003, 28 gauge, side clipped, ready, raised rib gun. I've been dreaming of a 32 inch 28 gauge pigeon gun for years for no reason other than I think it would be a beautiful little fun tool. But all the parts here that are completely unfinished, you know, just cast, just machine parts. And it's an interesting thing to see all of these things in their raw format because inherently it doesn't take a lot to get a piece of metal to look like that, but to get something to look like that, to then look like the over and under top lever or the side by side top lever, that is a lot of work. That is what you're paying for when you buy a Spanish gun is serious levels of handwork. So this is the stock department. You've got a, a finishing suite over there, if you will, with all the oils and a drying rack. Because these are all side locks of oxygen, they're side by sides, they're not trigger plated guns. You can make a stock like this. It's roughed out at the back and you have this big bulbous head at the front. You can tilt and fit how you fit the action into here, which will affect obviously the, the cast and drop. It's interesting just to see all of these old blanks, or even newer blanks that certain other makers and how, and how they look and how they go from, from this to what you want. I feel like this is more of a, a child's eyes gun, but there are short people in the world too, apparently. These, I suppose, all come from, a, from the past, 20, 20, 30 years ago, when the Spanish gun trade was a different creature to what it is today. But what is interesting is to see how successful the Spanish gun trade is today. This is where they finish the stocks. You've got them all drying on the wall there. You've got a series of oils and all sorts of things that will probably give you cancer in the state of California. This, this is one of my favorite workshops because although it might not be the busiest in terms of quantity of gun, the quality is there. There's a, there's a certain attitude here that's trying to drive things forward. And yes, that comes at a price, but you need the top standard guns so that everyone has something to dream about. And that's interesting that I'm finding myself dreaming of a Spanish gun. When perhaps when I first came here, maybe I was a bit gun racist, which I suppose we all are when a lot of people's first impression of Spanish guns might be an old Zabala LP31 that was, although very solid, not a pleasant gun to shoot. Same as when people's first impression of a Turkish gun is complete junk, they're never going to appreciate that that country might be able to do better. And I suppose in a few years time when Turkey is producing some great guns, not that they're not at the moment, we'll, we'll see. These few days in Spain will stay with me forever. If you haven't fallen in love with Spanish guns by now, book yourself a flight, come here and experience this kind of thing for yourself. The people we met, the education we received, and the memories we created will inevitably affect the way I see Spanish guns for the rest of my life.
I'm sure I'll be back to discover more about this place, its people, and the gun making culture here. But for now, it's time to search the internet for a Spanish gun to add to the collection. Thanks for watching guys, and we'll see you next time. Thank you for watching guys. This channel is made possible by our amazing sponsors. You can find out more about them in the description down below. And if you want to support the channel, you can join as a member. You get loads of extra content, well, some extra content, and occasionally we hook up and go clay shooting together as a membership group. If you don't feel like joining today, we really appreciate you watching and subscribing. Have a wonderful day. Whilst in Spain, yeah, cultural appropriation. What do you think of Spanish guns? What do you think the true future of Spanish gun making is? And what is your favorite Spanish gun?